Hello, and welcome back to Key Philosophies. Today, we will begin an initiation into Hermetics by Franz Barden, a course of instruction of magic, theory, and practice. This is a trilogy. This is where I was initially initiated, and I say that loosely, but does that really matter? I don't know. Anyways, when I was young, I was given the first of these three books. And I will read them to you over time. And hopefully I'll have something else to say about it. And um, there will be a commentary edition and a regular read-through is what I think I'll do. Here we go. Sacred Magic Edition. You can go to sacredmagic.com and they have some interesting resources there if you care to indulge yourself in this sort of thing. I don't recommend or unrecommend it at this point. So, part one, theory. Picture of the magician. It's about the elements, the element of fire, the element of water, air, earth, the light, the akasha, or ka akasha, or ethereal principle, karma, the law, cause and effect, Man about the body, the material plane, the soul, or the astral body, the astral plane, the spirit, the mental plane, truth, religion, God, asceticism. And part two, magic, mental training, thought control, discipline of thoughts. Coordination of thoughts, magic, psychic training, magic, physical training, magic, mental training, magic, psychic training, magic, physical training, magic, mental training of the step three and two, and so forth. These will go in stages throughout this book. There is no doubt that everyone who has been searching for the true and authentic cognition in vain looked for years, if not even for a lifetime, to find a reliable method of training. The ardent desire for this noble aim made people, again and again, collect a mass of books from near and far, supposed to be the best ones, but which were lacking a great deal for real practice. Not one, however, of all the seekers could make any sense from all the stuff collected in the course of time, and the goal aimed at so fervently vanished more and more in nebulous distances. Provided the one or the other did start to work on the progress after instructions so highly praised, this goodwill and diligence never saw 
any practical results. Apart from that, nobody could reliably answer to his pressing questions whether or not just this way he had selected was the correct one for his individual case. Just at this time, Divine Providence decided to help all those seekers who have been searching with tough endurance to find means and ways for their spiritual development. Through this book, universal methods are given into the hands of mankind by the highest initiate who is chosen by divine providence for this special task. It can be said without exaggeration that never before has these complete magical methods been accessible for the public. That's O.T. O.T. Wova, whom I don't know who that is. Anyone who shall believe to find in this work nothing else but a collection of recipes with the aid of which he can easily and without any effort attain to honor and glory, riches and power, and aim at the annihilation of his enemies, might be told from the very inception that he will put aside this book being very disappointed. Numerous sects and religions do not understand the expression of magic otherwise than black art, witchcraft, or conspiracy with evil powers. It is therefore not astonishing that many people are frightened by certain horror whenever the word magic is pronounced. Jugglers, conjurers, and charlatans have discredited this term, and considering this circumstance, there is no surprise that magic knowledge has always been looked upon with a slight disregard. Even in the remotest times, the Magus has been regarded as one of the highest adepts, and it might be of interest to learn that, as a matter of fact, the word magic is derived from this word. The so-called sorcerers are by no means initiates, but only imitators to the mysteries who, counting partly on ignorance and partly on credulity of the individual or the whole nation in order to reach their selfish aims, by lies and fraud, the true magician will always despise such practices. In reality, magic is a sacred science. It is in the very true sense, the sum of all knowledge, because it teaches how to know and utilize the sovereign rules. There is no difference between magic and mystic or any other conception of the name wherever authentic initiation is at stake. One has to proceed on the same basis according to the same rules, irrespective of the name given by this or that creed. Considering the universal polarities, rules of good and evil, active and passive, light and shadow, each science can serve well, at, can serve good as well as bad purposes. I'll say that's it. If that's the same with uh, Falun Gong and a lot of these other practices and I think that they I think there is a definitely a at least at least a similarity between them but, so I will go on let us take the example of a knife an object that virtually ought to be used for cutting bread only which however can become a dangerous weapon in the hands of a murderer it all depends on the character of the individual this principle goes just as well for all the spheres of the occult sciences. In my book, I have chosen the term magician for all of my disciples, it being a symbol of the deepest initiation and highest wisdom. Many of the readers will know, of course, that the word tarot does not mean a game of cards serving 
manticle purposes, but a symbolic book of initiation which contains the greatest secrets in a symbolic form. The first tablet of this book introduces the magician representing him as a master of the elements and offering the key to the first arcanum, the secret of the ineffable name of Tetragrammaton, the Kabbalistic Yadhe Vadhe, or Yadhe Vahe, excuse me. Here we will therefore find the gate to the magician's initiation. The reader will easily realize how significant and how manifold the application of this tablet is. Not one of the books published up to date does subscribe, does describe the true sense of the first tarot card so distinctly as I have done in my book. It is, let it be noted, born from the own practice and destined for the practical use of a lot of other people, and all my disciples have found it to be the best and most serviceable system. Tetragrammaton literally means four-letter word. It was a subterfuge to avoid the sin of uttering the sacred name, Yahweh, Y-H, B-H, or Jehovah, as it later became, when the vowels of another word were combined with the consonants of Yahweh. <clears throat> but I would, you know, and I'll note that Yahweh is, uh, Yahuwah, Yahuwah is another uh, pronunciation. But I would never dare to say that my book describes or deals with all the magic, or mystical problems. If anyone should like to write all about this sublime wisdom, he ought to fill folio volumes. It can, however, be affirmed positively that this work is indeed the gate to the true initiation, the first key to using the universal rules. I am not going to deny the fact that of fragments being able to be found in many an author's publications, but not a single book will the reader find so exact a description of the first tarot card. I have taken pains to be as plain as possible in the course of the lectures to make the sublime truth accessible to everyone, although it has been a hard task sometimes to find such simple words as are necessary for the understanding for all the readers. I must leave it to the judgment of all of you whether or not my efforts have been successful. At certain points, I have been forced to repeat myself deliberately to emphasize some important sentences and to spare the reader any going back to a particular page. There have been many complaints of people interested in occult sciences that they never got any chance at all to be initiated by a personal master or leader or a guru. <laughs> Therefore, only people endowed with exceptional faculties, a poor preferred minority, seem to be able to gain this sublime knowledge. Thus, a great many of serious seekers of the truth had to go through piles of books just to catch one pearl of it now and again. The one, however, who is earnestly interested in his progress and does not pursue the sacred wisdom from sheer curiosity, or else is yearning to satisfy his own lust, will find the right leader to initiate him in this book. No incarnate adept, however high his rank, may be can give the disciple more for his start than this present book does. If both the honest trainee and the attentive reader will find in this book all they have been searching for in vain in the years, then the book has fulfilled its purpose completely. That's from the author, Franz Barden. Part 1. Lecture of the Magician. The first tarot card. Interpretation of the symbolism. Below you will find the 
mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms expressed in a symbolic manner, the female on the left side and the male on the right side are the plus positive and the minus negative in every human being. In the middle is seen a hermaphrodite, a creature personifying the male and female, combined in one as the sign of consinity between the male and female principle. The electrical and magnetical fluids are shown in red and blue colors, electrical fluid being red, magnetical fluid being blue. The head region of the female is electrical, therefore red. The region of the genitals is magnetical, consequently it is blue. As for the male, it happens to be in the inverted order. Above the hermaphrodite, there is a globe as a sign of the Earth's sphere, above which the magician is illustrated with the four elements. Above the male, there are the active elements, that of fire in red, and the air element, which is in blue color. Above the female, there is the passive elements, the water element in green, and the element of the earth in yellow color. The middle along the magician up to the globe is dark purple, representing the sign of the Akasha principle above the magician's head. With an invisible ribbon for a crown, there is a gold, a gold-edged silvery white lotus flower as a sign of the divinity. In the inside, there is the ruby red philosopher stone symbolizing the quintessence of the whole hermetic science on the right side in the background there is the sun yellow like gold and on the left side we see the moon silvery white expressing plus and minus in the macro and microcosm the electrical and magnetical fluids Above the lotus flower, creation has been symbolized by a ball, in the interior of which are represented the procreative, positive, and negative forces which stand for the, cre the creating act of the universe. The eternal, the infinite, the boundless, and the uncreated have been expressed symbolically by the word Aum, and the dark purple to black color. theory. The great secret of the Tetragrammaton, or the Kabbalistic Yadhe Device. That which is above is also that which is below. Hermes Trismegistus, or what's attributed to be Hermes Trismegistus. There were a lot of things attributed to be Hermes Trismegistus, as we might come to know. Excuse me. So about the elements, everything that has been created, the microcosm as well as the microcosm, consequently the big and the small world have been achieved by the effect of the elements. For this reason, right from the beginning of the initiation, I shall attend to these powers and underline their deep and manifold significance in particular. In the occult literature, very little has been said about the powers of the elements up to now, so that I made it my business to treat this field of knowledge still unknown and to lift the veil covering these rules. It is absolutely not very easy to enlighten the uninitiated so that they are not only fully informed about the existence of the activity of the elements, but will be able to work with these powers in the future practically. The whole universe is similar to a clockwork with all of its wheels in mesh and inter interdependent from each other. Even the idea of the Godhead as 
the highest comprehensible entity may be divided in aspects analogous to the elements. Details about it are found in the chapter concerning the God idea. In the oldest Oriental scriptures, the elements are designated as tatwas. In our European literature, they are only considered on the grounds of their good effects, and insofar as we are warned against their unfavorable influences, which means that certain actions can be undertaken under the influence of the tatwas or else must be omitted. The accuracy of this fact is not to be doubted, but all that has been published up to this date points to a slight aspect of the effects of the elements only. How to find out about the effects of the elements respecting the tatwas for any personal use may be sufficiently learned from astrological books. I am penetrating far deeper into the secret of the elements, and therefore I have chosen a different key, which, although being analogous to the astrological key, has, as a matter of fact, nothing to do with it. The reader to whom this key is completely unknown shall be taught to use it in various ways, as for the single tasks, analogies, and effects of the elements. I shall deal with them by turns and in detail in the following chapters, which will not only unveil the theoretical parts of it, but point directly to the practical use of it, because it is here that the greatest arcanum is to be found. In the oldest book of wisdom, the tarot, something has been already been written about this great mystery of the elements. The first card of this work represents the magician pointing to the knowledge and mastery of the elements. On this first card, the symbols are the sword as the fiery element, the rod as the element of the air, the goblet as that of the water, and the coins as the element of the earth. This proves without any doubt that already in the mysteries of yore, the magician was destined for the first tarot card. Mastery of the elements have been chosen as the first act of initiation. In honor of this tradition, I shall give my principal attention to the elements for, as you will see, the key to the elements is the panacea with the help of which all the occurring problems may be solved. According to the Indian succession of the tatwas, it runs as follows. Acacia, the principle of air. Tejas, the principle of water. Waju, the principle of air. Epas, the principle of water. Rathivi, the principle of earth. In accordance with the Indian doctrine, it has been said that the four somehow grosser tatwas have been descended from the fifth tatwa, the Akasha principle, the ether. Consequently, Akasha is the cause, ultimately, and to be regarded as the fifth power, the so called quintessence. In one of the following chapters, I will inform the reader about this most subtle element, Akasha, in detail, the specific qualities of each element, beginning with the highest planes down to the grossly material level, will be mentioned in all the following chapters. By now the reader has surely realized that it is no easy task to analyzed the mystery of creation and word it in a way that everybody gets a chance of penetrating the topic to form a plastic picture of it all. The analysis of the elements will also be discussed and the great practical value of them underlined so that every scientist, whether he be a chemist, physician, 
magnetizer, an occultist, a magician, a mystic, a Kabbalist, or a yogi, etc., can derive his practical benefit from it. Should I succeed in teaching the reader so far that he is able to deal with the subject in a proper way and to find the practical key to the branch of knowledge most suitable for him, I will be glad to see that the purpose of the book has been fulfilled. The Principle of Fire As it has been said before, Akasha, or the etheric principle, is the cause of the origin of the elements. According to the Oriental scriptures, the first element born from Akasha is believed to be Tejas, the principle of fire. This element, as well as all the other, manifest their influence not only in our roughly material plane, but also in everything created. The basic qualities of the fire principle are heat and expansion. In the beginning of all things created, therefore must have been fire and light. And in the Bible we read, Fiat lux, there shall be light. The origin of the light, of course, is to be sought in the fire. Each element, and therefore that of fire, too, has two polarities, the active and the passive one, which means positive and negative. I will reflect on that briefly as you have uh, Prometheus as the light bearer and Christ as is often seen as, well, I mean, well, well, Prometheus brought, you know, man fire, and then you have Lucifer, the light bearer, and you have Christ, which is the light. Hmm. In some explanations of the mysteries, you see that sort of thing, and people argue as to the philosophies of them, but that I won't do here. So the active and the passive one, which means positive and negative, plus will always signify the constructive, the creative, the productive sources, whereas minus stands for all that is destructive or dissecting. There are always two basic qualities, which must be clearly distinguished in each element. Religions have always inputted the good to the active and the evil to the passive, but fundamentally spoken, there are no such things as good or bad. They are nothing but human conceptions. In the universe, there is neither good nor evil, because everything has been created according to immutable rules, wherein the divine principle is reflected, and only by knowing these rules shall we be able to come near to the divinity. As mentioned before, the fiery principle owns the expansion, which I shall call electrical fluid for the sake of better comprehension. This definition does not just point to the roughly material electricity in spite of its having a certain analogy to it. Each one will realize at once, of course, that the quality of expansion is identical with extension. This elementary principle of fire is latent and active in all things created. As a matter of fact, in the whole universe beginning from the tiniest grain of sand to the most sublime substance visible or invisible. On to three, the principle of water. In the previous chapter, we have studied the origin and the qualities of the passive element of fire. In this chapter, I am going to describe the opposite principle, the water. It is also derived from Akasha, the etheric principle, but in comparison with fire, it has quite contrasting qualities. These basic qualities are coldness and shrinkage. The point in question are also two poles, the active one being constructive, life-giving, nourishing, and productive, whereas the negative pole, similar to the one of fire, is destructive, dissecting, fermenting, and dividing. As this element owns the basic qualities of shrinking and contraction, it has produced the magnetic fluid. 
fire as well as water are operating in all regions. According to the rules of creation, the fiery principle would not be able to exist all by itself if it did not conceal inside as opposite the pole the principle of water. These two elements, fire and water, are the basic elements with the help of which all has been created. In consequence of these facts, we have everywhere to reckon on two main elements. Moreover, with the electrical and magnetical fluids, which represent the contrasting polarities. Now, four, principle of air. Another element derived from Akasha is that of air. Initiated people do not regard this principle as a real element, but they will grant it the role of a mediator between the fiery and the watery principles. So that the principle of air will, in a certain way, establish a neutral equilibrium acting as a medium between the active and the passive activities of water and fire. Through the interaction of the active and passive elements of fire and water, the whole creative life has become motion. In its mediatorship, the principle of air has assumed the quality of warmth from the fire and that of humidity from the water. Without these two qualities, any life would be inconceivable. These two qualities will also grant two polarities to the airy principle, which means in the positive outcome, the life-giving polarity, and in the negative aspect, the destructive polarity. In addition to that, let me say that the mentioned elements are not to be regarded as ordinary fire, water, and air, which would solely represent aspects of the grossly material plane, but in this case, universal qualities of all elements are concerned. Now, the principle of fire of excuse me, the principle of earth. It has been said of the principle of air that it does not represent an element proper, and this affirmation goes for the principle of earth likewise. Now, this means that out of the interactions of the three foresaid elements, the earthly principle has been born, and the last element, which by its specific quality, the solidification involves all the three elements. It is this quality in particular which has given a concrete shape to the three aforesaid elements, but at the same time, the action of the three elements has been limited with the result of space, measure, weight, and time having been born. The reciprocal action of the three elements together with that of the earth thus has been, thus has become tripolar, so that the earthly principle may be labeled now as a four-pole magnet. The fluid in the polarity of the earthly element is electromagnetic, all the life created can therefore be explained by the fact that all elements are active in the fourth, i.e. the earth element. Through realization in this element came out the fiat. It shall be. Details concerning the specific influences of the elements in the various spheres and kingdoms, such as the kingdom of nature, of animals and of human beings will be found in the following chapters. The main point is that the reader gets a general impression about the workshop and the effects of the elemental principles in the entire universe. 6. The light. Light is established on the principle of fire. Light without fire is inconceivable and for this particular reason, it is an aspect of the fire. Each fiery element can be converted into light and the other way around. Therefore, light involves all the specific qualities such as shining, penetrating, and expanding.
the opposite of light is darkness, which has come out of the principle of water. Darkness has the contrasting specific qualities of light. Without darkness, light would not only remain quite unrecognizable, but without darkness there would never be any light at all. Evidently, light and darkness must have been produced by the mutual play of two elements, consequently those of fire and water. Light in its outcome, therefore, has the positive quality, whereas darkness has the negative one. This interplay evidently is working in all regions. Akasha, or the ethereal principle. Several times while describing the elements, I have said that they proceed from the ethereal principle. Accordingly, the ethereal principle is the ultimate, the supreme, the most powerful thing, something inconceivable, the ultimate cause of all things existing and created. To put it in a nutshell, it is the causal sphere, therefore Akasha is spaceless and timeless, it is the non-created, the incomprehensible, the indefinable. The various religions have given it the name of God. It is the fifth power, the original power. Everything has been created by it and is kept in balance by it. It is the origin and the purity of all thoughts and intentions. It is the causal world wherein the whole creation and subsisting on, beginning from the highest spheres down to the lowest ones. It is the quintessence of the alchemist. It is all in all. Karma, an immutable law which has its aspect just in the Akasha principle, is the law of cause and effect. Each cause sets free a corresponding effect. This law works everywhere as the most sublime rule. Consequently, every deed proceeds from a cause or is followed by any result. Therefore, we should not only accept karma as a rule for good actions, as the Oriental philosophy puts it, but its signification reaches further and is a very deep one. Instinctively, all men have the feeling that something good can bring good results, only, again, all the evil must end up with, with evil, or in words of a proverb, whosoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Everybody is bound to know this law, and to respect it. This law of cause and effect governs the elemental principles too. I have no intention to enter into details of this law, which could be expressed in a few words, as they are quite clear so that every reasonable man will understand them. Subject to this law of cause and effect is also the law of evolution or development. Thus, development is an aspect of the karmic law. Man. About the body. Man is the true image of God. He has been created in the likeness of the universe. Everything great to be found in the universe is reflected in a small degree in man. For this reason, man is signified as a microcosm in contrast to the macrocosm of the universe. Strictly speaking, the entire nature manifests itself in man and it will be the task of this chapter to inform about these problems. I do not intend to describe the physical occurrences in the body because everybody can find information about it in any respective work. What I shall teach is to regard man from the hermetic standpoint, and I shall enlighten interested people as to how to use the fundamental key, the influence of the elements on man in the right way. 
A well-known maxim says, a sound mind in a sound body. The genuine truth of this aphorism represents itself immediately to everybody dealing with the problem of man. There surely will arise the question, what health is from the hermetic point of view? Not everyone is capable to answer this question. At the first instant, seen from the hermetic angle, health is the perfect harmony of all the forces operating inside the body with respect to the basic qualities of the elements. There need not prevail such a great disharmony of the elements or the element to set free a visible effect which is called disease. For disharmony in the form of sickness is already an essential disturbance in the workshop of the elements inside the body. The main condition for the novice is to concentrate himself absolutely on his body. The outwardly visible expression of the body resembles that of a beautiful garment. Uh, beauty, in all its respects, is likewise an aspect of the divine nature, beauty. Properly speaking, is not only that which pleases us, or appears to be sympathetic to our taste, but sympathy or antipathy are dependent on the interaction of the elements. Genuine health is rather a basic condition of our spiritual rising. If we like to live in beauty, we must form our house, our flat, or in this case, our body beautifully and fill it with harmony. According to the universal law, the elements have to perform certain functions inside our body. These are mainly building up the body, keeping it alive, and dissolving it. The positive part in the body, the building up, is therefore the business of the positive or the active side of the elements. The preserving part is brought about by the linking or the connecting part of the elements, i.e. the neutral, whereas the destructive or dissolving part of the body is realized by the negative qualities of the elements. It is obvious that the fiery principle in the active form with its electrical fluid will exert the active, expansive, building up influence. The contrary will be the case in the negative form. The watery principle in its active form will influence the building up activities in its negative form. It will produce the disintegrating, dissolving activity of all the fluids in the body. With the principle of air rests the task of controlling the electrical fluid of the fire and the magnetic fluid of the water in the body, keeping them in balance. For this reason, it has been characterized as the neutral or mediating element. It has been said in the fundamental key about the forces of the principle of earth that it has the function inside the body to keep together the influences of the three elements. In the active form of the earthly principle, it has an animating, vivifying, invigorating influence, and in the negative form, it is the other way around. The earthly principle is responsible for the thriving as well as for the aging of the body. We could mention quite a lot of analogies with respect to the influence of the elements inside of the body, but let it be enough with the foregoing explanations. And I'll say this, crystallization. Adepts of all periods never describe the effects of the elements in particular, probably to avoid any misuse, but they did know very well about it. They divided man in three basic concepts, attributing the head to the fiery principle and the abdomen to that of the water and the chest to the airy one as the mediating principle between fire and water. How every how very right they were with their dividing man becomes obvious as 
at the first look, because all that is active or fiery takes place in the head. In the abdomen, it must be the contrary, the watery, the secretion, the work of the sap, etc. The chest underlies the air and has a mediating part, because here breathing takes place quite mechanically. The earth principle, with its cohesive power or ability of holding together, represents the whole of humanity, human body, a whole of the human body, with all its bones and flesh. Now the question will arise where and how Akasha or the etheric principle occurs in the grossly material body. In doing some deeper thinking, everybody will be able to answer this question by himself, for the etheric principle is hidden in its most grossly material form, in the blood, and in the seed, and in the reci reciprocal action of these two substances in the vital matter or in the vitality. As we have learned, the fiery element produces the electrical and the water element, the magnetic fluid. Each of these fluids has two pole radiations, an active and a passive one, and the mutual influences and interactions of all the radiations of the four poles resemble a tetrapolar magnet which is identical to the secret of the Tetragrammaton, the yad heh of the Kabbalists. These are, this is like, like field dynamics, bioelectric field dynamics. Therefore, the electromagnetic fluid in the human body, in its emanation, is the animal magnetism, the ode, or whatever name it has been given. The right side of the human body is active electric, provided that the individual be right-handed. The left side is passive magnetic, as for the left-handed person. The contrary will be the, the opposite. The emanative power of this electromagnetic fluid is dependent on the capacitance i.e. the intensity of action of the elements inside the body. The more harmoniously this action of elements is going on in the body, all the stronger and purer this emanation will be. With the help of certain exercises, as well as by a correct attitude and an exact observance of these rules, the capacitance, strength, and influence of this electromagnetic fluid, or ode, can be increased or diminished according to whatever necessity requires. The way of doing it will be exhaustively illustrated in the practical parts of this work. And I'd say they're, they're exercised in, in the arts of, of uh, Falun Gong, where this is, uh, this this cultivation is very, very similar in its description. The electrical as well as the magnetic fluid in the human body have nothing to do with the kind of electricity or magnetism we know. Although a certain analogy exists, this law of analogy is a very important factor in the hermetic science, and the knowledge of it enables the adept to perform great miracles with the aid of this key. Which is exactly what, what they do on the, in the higher levels of Falun Gong. The food contains the elements mingled with each other. The results of taking in food is a chemical process by which the elements are preserved in our body. From the medical point of view, the taking in of any kind of food together with breathing causes a process of combustion. The hermeticist sees far more in this process than just a simple chemical event. He regards this combustion as a mutual dissolving of food, just like the fire is keeping burning is is keeping burning by fuel. Therefore, 
the whole life depends on the continuous supply of fuel, that is the food and the breathing. Stoking of the fire. To supply every element with the necessary preserving substances, a mixed food is advisable with contents which which contains the fundamental materials of the elements. If we were to restrict our whole life to a one-sided kind of food only, our body would without any doubt fall ill, meaning that such a kind of food would produce a disharmony in the body. By the disintegration of air and food, the elements are provided with the supporting substances, and in this way, their activity is maintained. Such is man's natural mode of life. If an element is missing, as it were, the fuel, all the functions depending on it, are immediately affected. If, for example, the fiery element in the body works excessively, we feel thirsty. The air element makes us feel hungry. The element of water causes us the feeling of cold, and the earthly element produces tiredness. On the other hand, every oversaturation of the elements causes reinforced effects in the body. A surplus of fiery element creates a yearning for movement and activity. If this be the case with the watery element, the secretive process will be stronger. Any oversaturation of the airy element indicates that we must be moderate in taking in food at all. As oversatur uh, an oversaturation of the earth element affects the aspects of sexual life, which must not necessarily find expression in the sexual instinct in the fleshly sense. It is quite possible, and this will especially occur in the case of elderly people, that they will feel a longing for increased activity and for productive agility. In their active and passive polarity, the electric and the magnetic fluids have the task of forming acid, combus acid combinations in all the organic and inorganic bodies. From the chemical point of view, eventually from the alchemist standpoint too, in the active sense they are constructive, and in the negative sense they are destructive, dissolving and disintegrating. All this explains the biological functions in the body. The final result is the circulation of life, which is brought into existence, thrives, ripens, and fades away. This is the sense of evolution of all things created. A reasonable line of life maintains the harmony of the elements in the body. As soon as a disharmony in the effects of the elements becomes manifest, the elements being extant in a weakened or a prevailing way, special measures have to be taken as far as food is concerned to carry the elements back to their normal course or at least to influence them favorably in this respect. Therefore, the most varying diets are prescribed for specific cases. In times long past, numerous observation led men to this opinion of which they ignored the exact reason. If the disturbance of the elements is such as to render visible this disharmony, it is no longer solely a disharmony, but we have to deal with an illness. This will mean that more drastic remedies will be necessary to reestablish the indispensable harmony. Providing we desire to bring the body back to its normal function and complete recovery. All the curing methods known up to this date have been based on this fundamental. This, I detest, excuse me, I desist from particularizing such methods, as most of them are generally known. The natural therapy employs thermic effects 
such as bathing, poultices, herbs, massages, etc., etc. The allopathist utilizes concentrated medicines, which are causing the effects corresponding to the elements and destined to repair health. The homeopathist brings to life the contrasting elements according to the device, similia similibus curanter, to achieve the balance of all that is in danger in conformity with the polarity laws. The electro-homeopathist, by use of his remedies, influences the electrical and magnetical fluids directly to balance the disorderly elements according to the kind of illness by a suitable reinforcement of these fluids. Hmm. That could be another explanation for Raymond Rife and, and uh, frequency therapy and the like. And so each curing method serves the purpose of restoring the disturbed equipoise of the elements by studying these influences of the elements on our body the magnetopath or the magnetizer has far more possibilities of influencing the body through his powers especially if he is capable to awaken the electrical or magnetical fluid consciously in himself increasing and transforming it into the part of the body that has come into disharmony i have dedicated a special heading of this book to the practical side of this treatment so far, the total functions of the body have been stated in detail, but each part of the body is also in analogy with the effect of the elements in the body, influenced by the specific element which finds its expression in the polarity of the responsive part of the body. It happens to be a very interesting fact that in the workshop, respectively in the clockwork or mechanism, which is to say, in the human organism, some organs from the inside to the outside reciprocally own the electrical fluid. And from the outside to the inside, they possess the magnetic fluid, which affects the functions in the entire organism in an analogous and harmonious way. In other organs, the reverse process takes place, the electrical fluid operating from the outside to the inside, and the magnetic one from the inside to the outside. This knowledge of the polar emanation is called, in the hermetic art, the occult anatomy of the body. And the knowledge of the effect of this occult anatomy is extremely important for every adept who wants to know his body, to influence and to control it. I shall therefore describe this occult anatomy of the human body with respect to the electrical and magnetic fluid. This is to say in the positive and in the negative sphere of action. This augments, excuse me, these augments will turn to magnetopath's great advantage because he will treat the sick part of the body with her with the electrical or the magnetic fluid, according to the center of the disease. But this knowledge will bring great profit to everybody else too. The head. The forepart is electric. The back of the head is magnetic. And so is the right side. The left side is electric. And so is the middle. The eyes. The forepart is neutral, and so is the background. The right side is electric, and so it is with the left side. The inside is magnetical. The ears, forepart, neutral. The back part also. The right side is magnetical. Left side electrical. Inside, neutral. The mouth and the tongue. The forepart is neutral, the back part as well. The right side and the left side both are neutral, and the inside is magnetical. The neck, the forepart, 
vac part and the right side magnetical, the left side and the inside electrical, the chest, the forepart electromagnetic, the back part electrical, the right side and the inside neutral, left side electrical, the abdomen, the forepart electrical, the back part and the right side magnetical, left side electrical, and the inside magnetic. The hands. The forepart is neutral, back part also, right side magnetical, left side electrical, the inside neutral. The fingers of the right hand, fore and the back part neutral, right side electrical, left side also, the inside neutral. The fingers of the left hand, the fore and the back part neutral, on the right side electrical, the left side as well, and the inside neutral. The feet, fore and the back part neutral, the right side magnetical, left side electrical, the inside neutral. The male genitalia, the fore part electrical, back part neutral, right and left side also, the inside magnetical, the female genitalia, fore part magnetical, the back part right and left side neutral, and the inside electrical. The last vertebra and the anus, fore and back part neutral, right and left side as well, the inside magnetical. With the help of this occult anatomy and the key of the tetrapolar magnet, the adept may compile further analogies if wanted. The alchemist will recognize that the human body represents a genuine athenor in which the most perfect alchemist processed the great work or the preparation of the philosopher's stone is visibly performed. Herewith, the chapter dealing with the body is finished. I do not assert that all has been regarded, but in any case, with respect to the elements, I mean to say the four-pole magnet, I have treated the most important problems and revealed the secret of the Tetragrammaton in view of the body. I think that will be a good end for now. Now we'll be back for the other half of this part as we progress through this initiation. Please give me all your input you would like down below. Everybody likes to learn. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening or watching. Give us a like if that's a thing. And I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.